Most of the discussion about markets focuses on stocks. And since the beginning of 2022, there's been a fairly widespread sell-off in equity across the world. However, there have been some really interesting developments recently in the credit market. And that's what we're going to focus on in this video. And I think that has the potential to spread volatility and potentially cause a crash in other markets across the world. So let's look at what's going on in the credit market in a bit more detail. Let's start off by looking at why credit matters in the first place. The word credit comes from credo in Latin, which means to believe in or to put your trust in something. And of course, if we do lend money to somebody, we're putting our faith in their ability to repay us on that loan. Now, of course, a single loan doesn't really matter. What matters is when you have an entire system, which is huge, where a large number of loans go bad. So that's why central banks are kind of obsessed with the credit markets, because what they're looking for are large markets where there's a lot of borrowing. But also it looks like that borrowing might not be repaid in full because it's simply unserviceable, the debt. So here you can see a nice heat map from the Bank of England in their financial stability report, which shows where they consider the hotspots to be in the global credit markets. Now, the first three bars here at the top are for households in the US, in the euro area, and in China. And whereas the US and the euro area do not have particularly high levels of credit worries, for the Bank of England at least, they consider that China's debt to GDP ratio from the household level is certainly quite worrying. Then if we look at the corporate level, so this is companies borrowing money rather than households, there you can see the debt to GDP ratio in the United States is a worry to them, and in particular the leverage lending market, which we'll look at in detail later. In the euro area, there aren't so many worries. But again, in China, we can see the debt to GDP ratio in the corporate lending market again is a worry. So this report was published at the end of 2019. And despite the fact that we've had a pandemic in the middle, now we're pretty much in the same place as we were then in terms of where the worries are focused. To see why US household debt isn't a problem, remember that most household debt is usually in the form of a mortgage, which we use to buy our house. And what really matters is what percentage of our income is paid to service our debt. Now, if interest rates are very low as they are now, we can take on more debt and still have fairly low debt servicing costs. And if we look at the debt servicing costs just before the global financial crisis in America, you can see that it reached over 13% of household income. Whereas if we look at the current debt servicing costs, they're much lower, much lower in fact than they've been for a very long time. So while house prices have certainly shot up recently in America, the debt servicing cost isn't that great as a percentage of household income. So that's why this particular market is not flashing red on the Bank of England's heat map. The Bank of England's done something similar for UK households, and they even consider what would happen if mortgage rates increased by 1.5%. Now, of course, we've already seen an increase of 0.5% since this report was published. But you can see that even if we did go up to 1.5% above where we started, it would still mean that the debt servicing burden would remain fairly low in comparison with where we were in 2007. So for UK households as well, this isn't flashing red on the kind of worry scale. Now here's another financial stability report, this time from the Federal Reserve in the United States. And this was published in November 2021. And what this looks at is the balance sheet of US companies. Now for a typical US company, the balance sheet leverage is shown by this black line. And indeed you can see that the balance sheet leverage now, even though it's declined slightly, is above where it was even in the global financial crisis in 2008. But if we look at the 75th percentile, which is the most levered companies, you can see that that is quite an extreme level of leverage. So that would definitely be flashing red on our leverage indicator if we were a central bank or an investor. But it certainly doesn't affect all US companies. It's focused in a subset of companies with the most leverage, as we'll see. To monitor the state of credit markets, we usually look at something called credit spread. Now that's defined as the extra income investors demand to take the credit risk of a company. And generally, if credit spreads increase, that means corporate bond prices will fall. So in a distressed credit market, we'll see credit spreads widen massively and we'll see bond prices fall sharply. Now there's actually a label for a company called a credit rating, which tells you its credit quality. 
And there are three big companies in the US which produce these ratings. There's Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch. So the highest credit quality is at the top, that's AAA, and the poorest credit quality is at the bottom, and that would be something like Single C. And that's a company that's just about to default on its debts. In other words, not be able to repay its lenders. But there's also a broad cutoff point where above this cutoff, which is triple B or higher, is considered to be investment grade. Those are the best quality credits, which are unlikely to default, even in a crisis. But for credit ratings of double B or lower, that's called speculative credit or junk bonds, or other people call it high yield. Because for these companies, when they borrow, investors demand to be paid much more. So their credit spreads tend to be much larger than they are for investment grade. Now we can actually take the yield of a bond, which is roughly what you earn every year, and we can break it down into components. So part of that yield will be the risk-free rate. Now that's the yield you'd receive if you lent money to the US government. And because they're the safest entity in the United States, they pay the lowest interest rates because their credit spread is effectively zero. But if we lend money to an investment grade company, we'd have to add an additional spread. And that's to take into account the credit risk. If it's a very high quality credit, you can see that that credit risk wouldn't be very big. There's also another consideration, which is how liquid that market is. If there's a crisis, you may not be able to sell your bond. So again, you demand compensation for that. So that's called liquidity risk. So effectively, you're going to add up these risk premiums. You're going to take the risk-free premium, and that's the duration risk, which means that if yields increase across any part of the fixed income market, you'll lose money. And then on top of that, you'd layer the credit risk and liquidity risk. Now let's look at what would happen if we had a high yield bond or speculative credit or junk bonds. Well, the risk-free rate would be the same, which is true if the bond had the same maturity, say, as an investment grade bond. You're still locking in a rate for a fixed period, and that's a risk. But notice how the credit risk is now bigger, and so is the liquidity risk, because high yield credit tends to be less liquid than investment grade. So when we look at the credit spreads, they actually have two components, the liquidity risk and the credit risk. And that's just taken as a given that it has both components. Now let's look at some actual credit spreads over time. And this graph goes back to 2019 and see if you can spot where the credit sell-off was during the pandemic. Yes, that's right, it's when we get this spike in 2020. So when the credit spread increased, the price of corporate bonds fell. Now this panel at the top shows you the triple A credit spread. Notice how it's absolutely tiny. Even at the peak of the sell-off, it only went a bit above 2%. Whereas if we look at the poorest quality credit, which is here in the bottom panel, and that's bonds which are rated single B, that's deeply into the junk bond category, here during that sell-off in 2020, the spreads blew out to over 12%. Now the interesting part is when we look at recent spread changes, notice how these have slightly increased. They're still nowhere near where they were in 2020, but you can see they've been gradually increasing since pretty much the end of last year. I've also marked on with this dashed red line the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Notice how that really didn't interrupt the trend of widening credit spreads. Now, why would that spread be increasing? Well, it's because people are firstly worried about recession. That's also why we saw equity markets sell off. The Federal Reserve's been raising interest rates, so that sometimes triggers a recession, and that could be bad for equity, and it could be bad for the credit market. So that was for the US. Now using this tweet from Efficient Market Hype, we can actually look across different regions. So this panel at the top shows you the credit spreads for Asia, both investment grade and also high yield, and high yield is the black line. And in fact, this region is the most distressed of all. So the axis for the high yield market is here on the left-hand side, and you can see here the spreads are very high. They've reached over 12% for the Asian markets. Now, part of that is due to the fallout from the Evergrande crisis and the problem with property developers in China. There have been defaults in that market, so of course the spreads have widened. The middle panel shows you the US, which isn't anywhere near as distressed. We have seen the credit spreads widen both in investment grade and high yield, but it's nothing like it is in Asia. And the situation in Europe is somewhere between the two, but probably closer to the US. So this is not just an Asian problem or a US problem, this is a global risk-off move in credit markets. And that could be a problem down the road if it gets worse.
Now, one way in which I think things could get a lot worse is by something which I'd call a downgrade cascade. To see what I mean by that, let's look at an ETF, which is for investment grade credit. Remember, these are the best quality credits. You wouldn't expect this ETF to sell off a lot if credit conditions worsen. However, if we look at the actual breakdown of the credits in this fund, you can see that about half of them are at the lowest notch of credit quality. That's triple B. One notch lower, and those bonds would be considered to be sub-investment grade. Now, what sometimes happens is a bond gets downgraded, a bond which is held by this fund, and then in the next rebalance, that bond would have to be sold. So that's why you sometimes see that even though this is an investment grade fund, it does have some double B rated debt inside it. So why is there so much debt at the lowest credit quality? Well, the fact is that most of the investment grade out there is actually triple B. This simply reflects the US market. Now that could be considered to be good for you as an investor because if it is triple B, it will have a higher yield. So the income on this fund would be higher. But currently credit spreads, as we saw, are not very big for investment grade credit. Now, if there was a shock to the system in the form of a recession, say, then it could suddenly become a big problem. Because what would happen if lots of companies got downgraded? Now, the fundamental problem with a recession as an investor is that the income for companies falls. That could either be because their margins are falling due to high inflation, say, or because people are spending less and companies are spending less, so that reduces their revenue. If a company's income does fall, then their ability to service their debt would also fall, and the company could get downgraded by Moody's or S&P or Fitch, or all three. The fundamental problem then is that so many of those companies, half of them, which are investment grade, are just one notch above junk. So if they do get downgraded, then all of these funds, all of these investment grade funds, would be forced sellers of their debt. The immediate consequence of so many funds selling its debt would be that the company's credit spread would widen. Now that itself will be a problem down the road, because if a company's credit spread is wider, that means that when it comes to roll its debt a few months later or a year later, it'll cost more to pay off its debt in future because when it issues that new debt, it'll pick up the bigger yield. So its debt servicing costs will be higher in future. Now, unless its revenue increases, that actually increases the probability of default. So this completes the cycle of the downgrade cascade, because then there'll be worries about other companies getting downgraded. And so even companies which are sound will see their credit spreads increase, and they could in turn be downgraded. So the fact that there's so much debt at the triple B level could trigger this kind of avalanche effect. And that could cause a big problem for equity as well, because a lot of the credits in the S&P 500, say, are not particularly high credit quality. So I think this is the most likely means by which we could get a fairly large crisis in credit in the United States, but also in other developed markets, for example, in Europe. So we've seen that the credit spreads are widening, what effect has this had on credit exchange traded funds? Well, as we said at the beginning, if credit spreads are widening, that means that the bond prices will be falling. And that means that the funds which buy those funds will also see losses. So here I've ranked the losses for several exchange traded funds which own US high yield credit. And these range from a loss of 2% since the beginning of the year, all the way down to about 7% for this Fallen Angel Fund from Van Eck. If we look at how those prices have changed since the beginning of the year, you can see that that Fallen Angel Fund has had a bit of a bounce recently, along with equity markets. In fact, that's true of all these funds because risk appetite picked up again. But you'll notice there's a cluster of funds here at the top which have fallen relatively little. And if you actually look at the nature of those funds, like BKLN, you'll see that it's the Invesco Senior Loan ETF. So what is it about these loan ETFs which have made them sell off less? Now, if you want to learn more about the credit markets, but also how macroeconomics affects investment, we talk about that kind of topic all the time in our Patreon community. You can ask questions on Slack from me or other members of the community, or you can ask for a particular video to be made, and that'll only be available to you as one of our supporters. So to learn more about that, just click on the link beside me and in the description beneath me. Given that leveraged loans have sold off less than other high yield bond funds, why are the Fed and the Bank of England so worried about them? To understand that, you have to understand exactly what a leveraged loan is. 
One attribute of a leveraged loan is that it's issued by a company which has very low credit quality. So the company's heavily indebted or it has a very poor credit rating. And the reason why it's called leveraged is that the company has a lot of debt relative to its assets, or alternatively, a lot of debt relative to its profits or earnings. Now, if you remember that breakdown of the yield we had for investment grade and high yield debt, now we can do the same thing comparing high yield debt for fixed income bonds, but also high yield debt issued as a leveraged loan, which is a type of debt called floating rate debt. It has much in common with other speculative credit. However, it doesn't have that risk-free component, and that's because it actually resets its coupon on a regular schedule. That means that you're not locking in the risk-free rate for any period of time. Of course, you're still taking the credit risk. You might still not get paid back your money, and you're still facing the liquidity risk. In a crisis, you may not be able to sell your leveraged loan. Now, whenever you buy a corporate bond fund, there's one number you should always check, and that's the duration of the fund. So if interest rates increase, the price of the fund will fall, and it'll fall by more if it has a long duration. So if you look on Morningstar, say, you'd be looking for this number, which is the effective duration of the fund measured in years. Now, notice for the BKLN fund, which had sold off very little so far this year, the duration is very short. It's just 0.1 years. If we compare that with one of the funds which had sold off a lot, which is ANGEL, A-N-G-L, the duration there is almost seven years. So immediately we can see one reason why ANGEL has fallen more than, say, BKLN. And that's because interest rates have been increasing. That risk-free rate's been gradually creeping upwards as we've been thinking about the Fed raising interest rates. And that meant that ANGEL fell as a result because it's a fixed coupon bond, whereas BKLN didn't suffer that fall. Any falls you see with BKLN would be due to the credit spread widening. Another reason central banks are worried about leveraged loans as a market in the US are because of the size of the market. It's grown a lot since 1997. So this is a table taken from the Financial Stability Report from the Fed in 2021, and they show the size of each of these markets. The US equity market is absolutely huge. It's $55 trillion. The residential real estate market in the US also huge, $44 trillion. Investment grade credit is about $7 trillion. High yield is about $1.6 trillion. And leveraged loans seem pretty tiny, just $1.2 trillion. But look at these long-term growth rates. If you look at all of these markets, the one which has been growing consistently fastest is the leveraged loan market. That's been growing at over 14% since 1997. So even though it's small in relative terms, it's actually growing incredibly quickly. If we plot the size of the market on the x-axis of this graph versus its growth rate on the y-axis, you can see how much leveraged loans stand out from the rest of the markets. Their growth rate is simply far higher than any of those other assets. Investment grade US debt has only grown at 8% since 1997. High yield has grown at just under 7% since 1997, but leveraged loans have grown at over 14%. Now, if this growth rate continues, it won't be long before they compete with those other markets. And then if we have a shakeout in leveraged loans, and it'll be a systemic problem. Now, there's actually a leveraged loan index issued by S&P in the United States. It's the LSTA index, and it tracks the average price of leveraged loans. Now, it was a really popular asset class in 2021 for a very simple reason. People were expecting interest rates to increase because the Fed said that it would increase interest rates. So why take that risk? Well, you go for floating rate debt, which pays you a big spread. Oh, leverage loans. But then you can see what happened in 2022. There's been a very sharp sell-off in that market. And that's what's got people worried right now. Now, if you buy a loan, there's a whole document that comes with it which describes the terms of the loan. Sometimes it's favorable to the lender, sometimes to the borrower. And if you look at the percentage of US leveraged loans which are covenant light, you can see that that's been increasing slowly, then quickly since 2009. Now, that's a problem to you as an investor because if there is a default, the amount of money which you retrieve from the borrower is very low. For most speculative credit, you'd expect a recovery of about 20% of your capital. But for these Cove Light loans, you'd only retrieve about 9 percentage points of your capital. So Cove Light increasing is a problem. 
Now, if we look at the number of actual defaults in the leveraged loan market, this is borrowers who have failed to repay their lenders, it's actually at very low levels. In fact, it's at a historic low. So this isn't an immediate problem. But the point is that if we get a recession, and that's what these gray shaded bars are, notice what happens to the default rate is that it increases rapidly. So this is why people are probably pulling back from the leveraged loan markets. The probability of a recession in people's eyes is increased, so they're worried that the defaults will also increase, and they'll be taking those very big losses on their cov light leveraged loans. Now in credit, it's always useful to know when these loans will come due. And sometimes there's a period of time when many of them redeem at the same time. And that's called a maturity wall. Now there was a maturity wall as of December the 31st, 2020, which would occur in 2025. However, because credit conditions were very easy at that time, lots of the companies which had issued leveraged loans actually just turned over their debt, reissued debt with a longer maturity, and extended the maturity wall. So as of February 2022, you can see that that wall has pretty much disappeared. And now the maturity wall isn't such a big wall after all. It actually happens in 2026. So as long as companies can issue new leveraged loans and roll over their debt, you can always extend the problem and pretend it's not there. But because we've had such volatility in this market and such very sharp price falls, it's now very difficult for companies, even relatively good credits, to issue in this leveraged loan market. So recently there was a deal with SS&C, which actually failed to be placed. And the bank that was issuing the loan, RBC, was left with lots of loans on its balance sheets. Now, investment banks do not want that. And it's not the first loan for this to happen this year. It's the fourth loan to be pulled in the US this year. And the credit quality was actually very good. It was BA2, just two steps below investment grade. Now, typically, that would be a very easy deal to place. So if companies can't roll over their debts easily, they're going to have to pay higher interest rates. And if you remember our cascade problem, there could be a problem with downgrades, but also worsening credit conditions in a recession. So in the leveraged loan markets, we are starting to see the wheels fall off the bus. We'll just have to see whether that gets worse, but it's definitely a market to monitor. Plus, we could get that downgrade cascade in the triple B section of the investment grade market, and that would be a real problem. I think not just for the credit markets, but it would spill over into the equity markets. And in particular, small caps, which have the most leverage. If you do want to avoid that kind of thing, you could always go, for example, for a quality ETF, which avoids too much leverage. That would probably take you through that kind of crisis without too much of a loss. So I hope you found that interesting. There is, remember, the offer to join our Patreon community. You can find a link to that in the description, but also beside me. And as always, thank you for listening.